called Flowering Plants for Four Seasons. My name is Rochelle LeVan and I've been a master gardener since 2022. And I'll be helping, I'll be the class host for this class. We wanted to uh, create this landscape success program with the Fort Bend Master County Fort Bend County Master Gardeners and with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension, which is an online class that helps the home gardener create and maintain a beautiful home landscape. So before we begin, just another reminder to please mute yourself and turn off your video. We will be recording this so that we can send it to all the participants or all the registrants within a week. So we ask that again, you mute yourself or turn off your and turn off your video so that we get a good recording. Okay, so today's class flowering plants for four seasons. I have the privilege to welcome Suma Mudan. And Suma is a passionate gardener. She moved from the East Coast and became a master gardener to learn about Southern gardening. She decided to quit her law practice to pursue her passions. Suma has been a master gardener for 10 years. She has advanced training in Texas superstar plants. Her passion has led her to become a garden designer and she loves to find unique and native plants for her clients. Her other hobbies include world travel, sharing and education, educating about essential oils for health, teaching yoga for specific ailments and pursuing all things beautiful for wellness. She believes in the adage, self-care is the best health care. So, Suma? Thank you, Rochelle. And thank you, everyone, for coming today. And uh, it's uh, nice to see some familiar names over the last few years. You have been coming uh, to these classes. And we have been changing a few classes here and there, adding new topics. Uh, so it's always nice to see you back. Uh, today, uh, one of the things that... As a gardener, like all of us want this lush color in our gardens. Um, and uh, we, the re when, when, I'm, when we moved from East Coast to the South, uh, uh, one of the reasons on my list was I can garden all year instead of from uh, Memorial Day to Labor Day, I can garden from January to December. And that has pretty much come to be the case. And um, today I'm going to share like over the years, we, it's been like 14 years since we moved here and over the years, um, like we did a lot of trial and error and I learned a lot of things. And now I think I'm pretty comfortable with uh, uh, both having um, like a, a bounty of color throughout the year, as well as dealing with the freezes, dealing with the like uh, severe summers. So with all these uh, drastic changes in weather, I also have learned which plants work best here. So I'm going to share all that with you today. And of course, this is not very comprehensive because we have only a, an hour, hour and a half to talk about these things, but there are a lot of uh, websites that we are going to talk about, which, which will give you a lot more information and you can always come back to Master Gardener Hotline to ask more questions. So we are always there to answer your questions uh, with your uh, home landscapes. So Texas A&M has two uh, programs that are geared towards this uh, sustainable gardening concepts. The first one is called Earthkind Landscaping. And Earthkind Landscaping, I, if you guys have uh, attended the first class that was taught by Peggy D. D. Hemacourt, she went over the basics, the foundations of uh, uh, the, like, uh, best practices in landscaping and they are based on this earth kind landscaping principles so this in this program um, the homeowner will learn uh, the basic uh, foundational principles for establishing good soil uh, good irrigation good plant selection so these are the fundamental steps for success throughout the rest of the gardening season um, so those are the principles that we need to follow. And we'll also share the website for you to, uh, to go over this in more detail. Uh, the next one uh, actually is Texas Superstars uh, program, but this is relatively new compared to Earthkind. 
So here, this is focused mostly on plants. So Earth kind covers all the aspects of landscaping, whereas Texas Superstar covers the plants that do well in Texas. So when we say plants that do well in Texas, the first question that should pop up into your mind is, but Texas is huge, it's thousand miles across. And there are like several um, like weather zones in Texas. So how can one plan do well in all those all these zones? So we learn um, as we go over this presentation, we learn how that happens. So Texas has uh, the zones uh, from 6A to 9B. So these are the climate zones that uh, um, that that are uh, uh, like uh, that that are throughout the U.S. and um, so these Texas superstar plants will do well in all these zones. So they're hardy, they're tolerant of our hot and dry summers. And one of the main criteria is they, they are disease and insect resistant. So one of the basic principles of good gardening uh, practice is uh, our ability not to baby our plants or not to spray them uh, constantly, to have plants that will survive and they're resistant to diseases. So the Earth Kind program and Texas Superstar plants go hand in hand. Um, and I, as I mentioned, the first class was went over the fundamentals of Earth Kind gardening. And both programs form a partnership where you lay the foundation with Earth Kind program and you select the right plant for the right place uh, with Texas Superstar plants. Uh, so this, once you follow these two things, uh, I guarantee you that you will have a great thriving garden uh, throughout the year. So uh, let's talk about some fundamentals before we go into details. Uh, the, most of you are gardeners. That's the reason you are here in this class. And you, uh, you may already know these basics, but I like to just refresh uh, some of the basic things. So there are various plants uh, based on their behavior. They are either labeled as perennials or annuals or uh, biannuals. So perennials are the plants that come back every year and they have a longer life. And we, uh, we have to have these as the backbone of our gardens because once you have established perennials in your garden, then you can work around them to fill the gaps with annuals or other things. Uh, this way, even after freeze, the perennials will come back and you are you will not see those uh, like big patches of uh, baldness in your garden. So they, they will be always plants in your garden. And uh, last four seasons, whenever we had freeze, after the freeze, I, I can't tell you how many times I heard, oh my God, my, there's nothing in my garden. Everything died. But if you wait for a few weeks after the freeze, all these perennials pop up. So that's why we first need to focus on perennials. And uh, this will help us to meet the challenge of having something colorful throughout the year. Uh, it is a challenge, but it's doable. And, uh, you know, it's like there's nothing that gives us more thrill than in the heat of summer. Last year, it was like for two months, it was 100 degrees. But even then, I had something flowering. And then we had freeze in uh, January. And even then, I had something uh, flowering. So that is again a challenge, but it is totally doable. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. And uh, as I stop at any stopping point, I'll, I'll ask Rachel if there are any questions and she'll run them by me. And if we have time in the at the end of the talk, you can unmute yourself and ask me questions as well. So uh, what are the tools for plant selection? I mentioned right plant for the right place. So between, between EarthKind and Texas Superstar websites, you can find all the tools you need. So even if you are a brand new gardener, even if you are just starting out, uh, you can, these websites are so user-friendly that you can put, uh, I will walk you through a few um, like uh, see, uh, screens of these websites you will know uh, how easy it is to find a plant uh, for that particular spot, for that particular season, for that particular height, uh, for that particular uh, light conditions and all those things. Uh, so you can select plants for your location, for the season, and also the growth ha habit 
Do you want a tall plant? Do you want a nice shrubby plant? Or do you want a tree? So you can put all those parameters into your search criteria and come up with the right plant. So this is the EarthKind website. And Rachel, if you can put the EarthKind uh, website link in the chat, uh, you guys can copy the uh, link and uh, save it for your future reference. So this is the AgriLife website and the arrow points to the EarthKind landscaping. So you click on that and you then you go to the EarthKind plant selector. And once you are here, you can see the six zones like three plus three, the, yeah. So all the zones that are in Texas. So this is the, in is A is the coldest and H is the hottest. Uh, and you can look for your climate zone uh, when you are searching for these plants. So you can search by zip code or you can search by region. You can search by F, uh, our region is F by, in Houston. So you can search by that or you can search by zip code. And once you're here in this screen, then you can either put in the common name or uh, you can also like uh, put the growth growth habit like do I do you want a shrub? Do you want a tree? Do you want uh, uh, a short plant or whatever? And you can also put the exposure. Are you looking for uh, plants for full sun, partial sun, or shade or partial shade? So you can you can also put those and blooming. Uh, you can you can see whether you want spring, summer, fall, or winter. And this is very important because if you want to have coloring plants for uh, flowering plants for uh, all the four seasons, you need to pick plants for each season. Um, so you can search here which season uh, you are looking for. So if you're planning for spring, start planning in fall, the previous fall. That way uh, they will be like ready in spring. Same thing, start one season before for the next season. Um, and then you can search all plants. But I also want to mention here that the more restrictive the criteria, the, uh, the lower number of results you will get. So try to keep it broad um, initially, the search, and then you can narrow it down more and more. So for an example, um, we searched for, okay, let me go back to the previous one. Uh, search Now we are searching for plants in region G, Southeast Texas, and we didn't check any of the boxes. So the results you got may be, like you can see, 223. Uh, so that is very broad. You can narrow it down, but let's go with this for now. So we will take the example of uh, the Turks cap in this uh, in this like 223 plants. Let's just talk about Turks cap. So Turks cap, if you see, uh, this is the uh, description of this plant. Okay. So the common name is Turks cap, and the scientific name and the uh, and the family, and it gives you the description. It's a perennial. It spreads from root suckers and seeds. Uh, and it is like, if you go down and see uh, hardiness zones, 8, 9, 10, 11, and earth kind index is 10. So it's it goes from 1 to 10. This is like an index of 10. So this actually is very good. That means it will come back uh, without fail. It will come back, whether it is freeze or, uh, uh, you know, um, like severe summer or whatever, it will come back. But the downside is, it also means that you may never be able to kill it. So if you have a uh, turf cap in your garden, it will show up in various places because it's so tough, you cannot get rid of it. But it's also, it has a lot of benefits. It attracts hummingbirds, it attracts pollinators, and it grows really like a nice big shrub with all these uh, beautiful red flowers. Uh, and if you have a corner where you want to hide anything like your utilities or anything like that, this is a great plant. So keep all that in mind when you're looking for this, uh, uh, going through this plant selector. What is the purpose of this plant that I'm picking? And is it going to serve that purpose or is it more 
or less and also see the height width and height two feet by six feet so it is actually big and uh, uh, you need to look at that and look at the blooming period spring summer and fall so it's a very long blooming period also exposure it is so uh, you know um, it, it, it will survive in any kind of uh, exposure sun partial sun or shade so it's very versatile and it is a great plant to have. That's one example. And now coming to uh, Texas Superstar Plants. So this is the website, Texas Superstar Plants. And it, uh, if you look at the number of plants we have in this program, it's not really much. Um, because if you look at annuals or specialty, or if you, I let me see if I have, yeah. So there are not that many plants because this program has been around for about 30, 35 years, and uh, it takes a lot of long time to test these plants. They are tested in these uh, six climate zones, and they are tested for several years, several seasons. They are tested for their uh, uh, reliability, their hardiness, and their disease resistance. So once they pass all these criteria, Only then they can make it into the category of Texas Superstar. So that's why we don't see many plants that come into this uh, program. Uh, it's a slow process. There are, and most of these are common plants, but you have to meet all the criteria to be labeled as Texas Superstar. And I have to apologize. I'm uh, uh, just recovering from cold. So I may have coughed now and then. So here you can see, if you see the these uh, water levels, most of the plants are low water use. So they are, they are very uh, um, use, user friendly. You don't have to spend too much water for these plants. And there are very few plants that have high water use. Again, the website has a lot of information on each of these plants. And you can, uh, and each plant will give you again whether this is spring, summer, or fall or winter. And based on that, you can pick the plants and then you can plant. Any questions so far, Rachel? We have one question. Um, I don't know if you can list this answer quickly, but. Is there a list of nurseries that sell the native plants? Because a lot of them are hard to find. Yeah, at the end of the presentation, I have a list of nurseries. Okay, so you great. can take a screenshot of that. Thank you. Yeah, because that's a very common question. And uh, um, since I keep looking for unique plants and I keep looking for Texas Superstar plants, um, I'm familiar with these nurseries that carry them, and we'll talk about it later. Thank you so much, Simo. That's yeah, it. Sure. So, um, seasons. Now, let's talk about seasons. Spring, like, you know, these seasons keep changing. These season, uh, seasons keep moving. Sometimes we have spring, like, as early as in February. And sometimes, most of the times, it's like March to late May. And this year, actually, I have seen real spring where the mornings are nice and cool in 40s and 50s. And during the day, it's nice and uh, like uh, 70s and 80s. We hardly get this kind of spring. So what, what is happening this year is because of the school temperatures, probably you all noticed, the roses are exploding. It's the perfect weather for the roses. And, uh, but we don't get this very often. So summer, late May to mid-September fall September to early December and uh, winter is early December to late February. So fall is not really fall. Like uh, like uh, Rochelle mentioned, I moved from East Coast and fall is real fall there. Uh, everything starts dying, uh, almost like everything dies in September, October and doesn't wake up till April, May. Uh, but here fall so almost feels like summer. We have probably summer and maybe a little bit of winter throughout. But these are 
like you know the normal seasons then we'll talk about plant heights front middle or back of the beds so depending on since i'm also into design depending on where you are planting your plants if the plant is tall you may want to plant it behind and you may want to have like arrange them by height uh, so that everything can be is visible in your beds um, and watering and light needs so if you are planting also plan for plants that are that have similar watering needs and similar light needs if a plant needs uh, some shade and you plant uh, another plant that needs sun one of them is going to suffer so keep that in mind and uh, uh, so the these are basic things, but it the, it goes a long way if you pay attention to this in the very beginning. And also, <laughs> I cannot emphasize this more. Like things to consider, I have seen this. I have done this myself, and I have seen this happen many many times. Um, future growth potential. We see a plant now and it looks small and we think okay let me put this you know um close to my uh foundation and then given like two three years then it is so big the branches are jetting into the foundation to the wall and there's no space for the plant to grow the other thing that uh, the other mistake common mistake i see uh happen time and again which i also did is like filling the beds we, we look at these spaces in our beds and we think, oh my God, there are so many gaps. I need to put more plants, more plants, more plants. And then everything starts growing and they're growing into each other. So that uh, limits the air circulation and that is a potential ground for uh, fungal diseases and all that. So we even though it looks as if we have a lot of gaps, even though it looks empty, even though it looks naked, we need to... Uh, you know, uh, bear with that for the first one or two years and let the plants spread in our beds uh, because they will grow. The, what you can do if, if it is tough for you to see those spaces, what you can do is uh, you can add annuals in those spaces. Uh, let the perennials grow, take their time and just add annuals here and there. So that way you will, uh, the annuals will die, the perennials will have the space to grow. And when they are in their full growth, then you don't need to add any annuals. So keep that in mind. So also, if the plants are too close together, uh, there's not enough light. And what happens is the top is okay. The top is fine and green. And the bottom starts browning up because there's no light reaching to the plant, around the, around the plant in the bottom. So keep that in mind. And we talked about spacing. Now let's talk about habit. Is it upright? Is it bushy? Or is it spreading? Or is it whining? So all these things make a difference because based on this, you need to provide the right space for the plant. If it is upright, if it is like a small tree, then it's okay. You can plant it and then plan some, to plant something around it. If it is bushy, it needs space. It will occupy maybe three, four feet around it. So you cannot plant anything else around it. And if it is spreading, you will have like millions of plants in a year or two. So one thing is you can share with your friends, so make more friends. Um, and you can also spread them at, in different places in your garden because when you're just starting out, you don't want to invest so much money in buying plants. So you can use all these plants and move them around in your garden. If it is whining, you need to think about providing it a trellis, like how is it going to whine some are some need really sturdy trellises. Uh, some are like clematis is very delicate, so it doesn't need it. Maybe it needs just a uh, one panel. But there are uh, rose climbers and there are like, Texas wisteria, evergreen wisteria, which needs really sturdy trellis. So you need to keep that in mind. And how big does the vine grow, and how much uh, sun it does it need? So keep that in mind. The next thing is soil and mulch. Uh, soil, you again, there is no one answer for different kinds of plants because uh, different plants need different kinds of soils. So for example, roses, azaleas, camellias, 
um, gardenias, um, blueberries. So all these need some acidic soil. Either you can uh, you can buy the rose soil from the nurseries, or you can add some uh, acid acidic fertilizer to the soil. Uh, so that will give them the uh, adequate uh, foundation to grow and thrive. And <laughs> hanging baskets. So this is one mistake uh, people make. They use the same potting soil for hanging baskets, which makes them very heavy, one. And it also, because once you add water and the soil is like dense, the hanging basket becomes very heavy. So there is special soil for hanging baskets, which is lighter. So, or you can mix your own. You, you add some, take some uh, potting soil, add some perlite, and you can also add some wood chips to make it lighter. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. But the downside is they need more water because they are hanging and you need to hand water them unless you have a drip system. So that is one thing to think about. So fertilizing, the second, the next thing is fertilizing. Um, generally, if you're using potting soil, the potting soil already has uh, some fertilizer mixed in it. So you don't need to do right away. But in the growing season, like rose, roses are heavy feeders. Uh, some plants are hibiscus. Those are all heavy feeders and they will benefit by uh, getting periodic fertilization. So uh, like read the instructions for each plant and uh, like follow that. So I generally use Osmocote or Nutricolor for flowering plants and Microlife for uh, fruiting like edible plants, uh, vegetables and fruits. Uh, so that's that's the basic. Like I said, we cannot cover in depth all these things, but this is just giving you an overview of how uh, what are the foundations of good uh, practices. Pruning. Pruning is something that people are very afraid of doing. Uh, if you miss the right window to prune, like uh, this year, the roses are like the general guideline is um, Valentine's Day for pruning roses. Uh, and fertilizing is Valentine's Day, Mother's Day and Father's Day kind of thing. Uh, but if you miss that, roses have like, because of the weather, they, they grew so fast, you miss the window. And spring is the heavy pruning. And summer is the uh, like light pruning. Uh, so we need to keep on top of this pruning things. And we also need to uh, see uh, if it is like uh, we are talking only about flowering plants. So I'm not going to talk about fruits. Um, so, but most of the flowering plants, even the annuals and perennials, will benefit from a haircut in uh, late summer when the weather is 100 degrees, everything keeps like slows down and dies down a little bit. So you cut it down a bit. And once the temperatures drop down to 90, 80, then they start growing back again. So uh, pruning is important. And late winter, when everything really slows down, that's a good time to keep them in shape. Uh, so you can see where uh, there is dead branches and also it's a good uh, season to prune. So let's talk about each season now. So spring, of course, is the most, like the easiest season. Every, all the nurseries are like, you know, um, so many plants available in spring. Um, and uh, it is, it is, everybody has a spring fever. So it's the most like exciting time to start gardening. But it will help for us to plan a little early, uh, like the following, uh, the previous fall. So you can, the, the best season to plan is the season before. And you can do both seeds and seedlings. If you want to be um, frugal, you can start with seeds. <laughs> and a lot of plants like Cosmos, um, Larkspur, all these plants uh, are very easy to grow from seed. And you can start seeds, if it is too cold, you can start seeds indoors in G December or January. Okay, I just mentioned Larkspur. So we'll go over uh, like some plants in detail for each season. So Larkspur is, uh, right now, if you are in Sugarland or 
wherever if you went to Costco, I think a lot of people have seen delphiniums. Delphiniums are really bushy with the like beautiful color, but they don't grow well for us here. It's too hot for them. So uh, larkspur is our answer to delphinium. It resets means it drops the seeds this season and next season you'll get more plants and it's beautiful. It comes in pink and purple and white. Uh, so this is a great plant. Uh, Laura bush petunia tidal wave. See these see these also reseed. Uh, I see Laura bush petunia popping up at various places in my garden, and uh, you plant once and you are blessed with many seasons of plants. So and these are very uh, nice to add in the hanging baskets or uh, flower beds. New gold antenna is uh, and. You can see the Texas Superstar uh, logo here. So all these are Texas Superstar plants. I do have some plants that are not Superstar plants, but um, not many. I, I didn't add many of those in the presentation. Again, this is a very good plant to cover problem areas because it will spread and it creates a pop of color. And for roses, if I mentioned roses before, but this is the first rose I started with. Uh, and this is both an earth kind and a Texas superstar plant. And it really doesn't need any care. It grows very well. It blooms profusely. It has beautiful fragrance. You don't need to spray. It's a great plant to start with. And knockout roses, who doesn't know knockout roses? The contractors, the builders, they use knockout roses everywhere because uh, it, they are so easy to grow. Again, they create that mass of color, very attractive. The only downside is since they plant them in on ma and mass, if one gets a disease, it spreads like wildfire. So keep that in mind when you're planting. And also in summer, they look sad. And that's the time to prune them down. And fall, they will revive. This is, again, one of the best little trees that one can have if you have a small, a small yard. Uh, this, uh, again, this is our answer to lilac. In East Coast, we grow lilacs, which, which have fragrance. Of course, Vitex doesn't have fragrance, but it's beautiful. And it comes back every year. Uh, it's a great little plant to have. So summer. Summer is a little tough for us because summer starts with uh, 95, 9900. And, um, you know, it gets a little tiring. So again, for summer, uh, plant in spring, either saplings or seeds. There are a lot of seeds that you can plant in spring, like uh, gomfrina uh, and um, sunflowers, a lot of plants that you can uh, start from seeds in spring for summer. And also a um, lot of uh, bulbs that you have uh, planted in spring uh, those start, they are done with flowering, but they are still, the green stalks are still there. So you may feel that, oh my God, these are looking so ugly. What do I do with them? So then that is uh, one idea is um, you can start the summer plants around those bulbs in spring. So when the bulbs are done, these plants are growing and they will hide the foliage. So it's important not to cut the foliage for, bul for uh, bulbs because the bulbs have to uh, grow throughout the summer. They need that energy to plump up the bulb for the next season. So if you cut the foliage, they will not do the photosynthesis and they will not grow healthy. So you need to keep the foliage. And uh, to hide the foliage, you can plant something around it. But you need to plant. Um, any questions so far on spring, Trisha? Okay. No questions. We're good. So summer, continuing with summer, Angelonia. Uh, for Texas Superstar plants, it's also important for you to notice the uh, the cultivar. So this is the Serena series. Now all the nurseries are carrying this. And the regular nurseries are also carrying this. Just make sure that you see this name, Angelonia Serena. So these are the ones that are bred for disease resistance and uh, health and vigor. Uh, and these come in various colors. So angelonias grow about two feet and you can plan according to the height and according to the color. So there is pink and purple and white. So you can 
have a mass of uh, purple and mass of pink, or you can mix it with other plants um, and uh, create that uh, sense of color. Uh, either you can do a monochromatic one color or you can have contrasting colors. Uh, pentas are also, but they are butterfly deep pen, uh, pink pentas. Uh, these is we have to realize that uh, even though some of these plants are labeled as annuals, because of our seasons, if the winter tends to be mined, even if we have a freeze for three four days, most of these plants may come back. So they are not really annuals; they behave like perennials, um, and it does happen. Um, and uh, pentas can be a nice splash of color in the middle of the border. And all these plants will benefit from a little pruning in late summer. So in fall, again, you will have that nice bushy growth. So vinca also actually um, behaves like a perennial, even though they call it annual. And vincas uh, are very versatile. Uh, they come in uh, these various uh, colors and bicolor, and they're great in hanging baskets. They're great in containers. Uh, when, you, when you want to add some interest, uh, like in a space, uh, at least on a temporary basis, the best way to do it is, best and fastest way to do it is add a container, add a pot, colorful pot, and fill it with this, you know, hanging uh, uh, winkers and like, add some angelonias, vincas, you can mix and match, and it creates so much interest in a spot if you think that it's empty. And this is one of my favorite uh, plants, and this is a perennial, uh, trailing purple lantana. So uh, lantanas, are, we saw the yellow lantana, but this is a trailing lantana. That means it actually flows over the bed or over the container, uh, over the box. And um, this, the other interest is uh, in fall, it the leaves change color into bronze. In summer, spring and summer, they're like bright green. And in fall, they become this bronze. It's very interesting. Of course, no garden should be without salvias. Some salvias like the uh, Salvia gregae, uh, the red one, is quite invasive. That means you can share uh, share the plants with all your neighbors and friends. But some of the mystic spires is not, uh, it doesn't, it spreads, but not that much. And salvias are salvias or sages. They're excellent pollinators. So if you have an edible garden, vegetable garden, fruit garden, if you plant salvias around them, you will attract the bees and butterflies and they will do the pollination for you. And uh, salvias are very easy to grow and they are uh, must have plants and they spread year after year. And this is uh, Gomfrina globe amaranth and it is also uh, um, great in summer. Uh, in, generally in fall and uh, fall, late fall, early winter, early spring, we have uh, snapdragons, we have pansies and these take the place of those plants in summer. And gofrina also comes in various uh, uh, black, purple, pink, and white, so you can mix and match. And it, it really tolerates drought. Any questions on summer? A question about the Angelonia. Yeah. The Arc Angel series. Is that, I know that's, a, is that a good plant for us? I know the Serena series is Texas Superstar, but what are I your thoughts not, on the I don't Arc Angel? think Arc Angel is Texas Superstar, but it doesn't mean that it's not good. You can try it out. Okay. And then also, do you know if there's a list or do you know of any that you can um, offhand of any Texas super, superstar plants that have good color and fragrance? Fragrance, interesting. Um, 
I think Mexican butter butterfly wine has fragrance. Um, I think I have to think about it. If I think, I'll put it in the chat. Okay, that sounds good. Come to my mind. And um, autumn sage is a yeah. type of salvia. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So autumn sage is like uh, reddish pink. And it is one of the better behaved salvias because it doesn't really grow very tall and uh, it is it is nice and compact. I like it. And one other question. Do you know if it's okay to plant blue bonnets next to corn and onions? Corn and onions. I have no idea, but blue bonnets should be planted in fall for spring. That I know. That's it. That's oh. it. Okay. Oh, wait. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So fall. Uh, again, uh, if we if we want uh, plants as a color for fall, we need to plant in early summer. Either Again, it is either saplings or seeds. You can either buy the starter plants from the nurseries or you can start seeds. So there's always an opportunity to start from seeds. And the best way is to experiment because you spend only two or three dollars on the seed packet. And if they all come up, there's no nothing more exciting than that. And you know, you can fill up your garden. Um, and also there are several uh, summer plants that will, uh, if we give the plants a little bit of pruning, they will revive in fall. But one other planning idea is you can take cuttings uh, from the summer plants and start root them either in water or in soil and make more plants. So most of the plants are very easy to propagate like lanternas, angelonias, vincus. Alternanthera is uh, a leaf plant, but it has different colors of leaves and it is a great filler for containers. Coleus, coleus is great. It's not a, a superstar, it should be, but it, it uh, like fills so much color and it's so easy, the one of the easiest things to propagate, just uh, like uh, snip off a branch and stick it in water. In four days, you will see the roots. Uh, so it's very easy. Fall. So actually, uh, Cape Plumbago uh, starts now in spring, but it explodes in fall. So once the so weather uh, cools down a little bit, uh, it does even better. This is again one of my favorite plants um, because in, in summer it has this purple panicles of flowers and birds love them. But in, in fall, all those flowers become these golden berries and birds really love them. And you they look great in flower arrangements too. So it's a very versatile, it's a small tree uh, and uh, you need to give it the space it needs. And this is uh, one of, uh, it's a very popular plant, Goldstar Esperanza. Uh, it creates that, again, that uh, impact of color, the bright yellow. If you want to uh, light up any shady corner with a little bit of morning sun and afternoon shade, this does very well. This is, again, one of my most favorite plants, Hamelia, which is also called hummingbird bush. It also has that fall color change. So we do have fall color in uh, Texas, believe it or not, at least in Houston. And it is this nice bright green uh, in summer, in spring and sp summer. And in fall, it has this rusty, uh, nice uh, dark leaves. And hummingbirds love it. So trialis is one of the uh, like great plants to have. You can even use it as a hedge. Um, and uh, it is it has a lot of tiny yellow flowers, uh, but since there are so many, it creates that interest. So winter, winter is the like everybody dreads winter. So is it the end of gardening season? I used to think so, but it's not. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about plants that are not part of uh, Earthkind or Texas Superstars, and but uh, I experimented with these plants and all these bloom in winter. 
So this is somebody's yard. And of course, pansies are so versatile and they create that pop of color in winter. Even if there is snow, pansies will not die. They will, they will bounce back. And it's very easy to grow them from seeds as well. And fall zinnias also come back in spring and they continue to bloom through the winter. So this is uh, possum ha holly. Uh, it, it, it has leaves in summer and fall, but in winter, all the leaves dis disappear and all these red berries uh, come up. So it's like a Christmas tree um, in the garden. This is again a great plant, uh, Ligularia or tractor plant, tractor seed plant. And it is, it has this big glossy leaves. Um, and uh, uh, it, it in winter, like in November, it starts blooming. So it has this nice bright yellow flowers. It I have these plants under my oak trees in my friend garden, front yard, and they provide such interest in winter. Unfortunately, if we get freeze, uh, if you cover them, they'll be fine. Uh, if you don't cover them, you lose the blooms, but it'll come back. So that's the problem with that. And this is again a winter bloomer. It's uh, it's not very well known Hong Kong orchid tree or bahonia. Uh, it blooms from winter to early spring. And I have had this is from my garden. So I have had this tree filled with blooms every year. And last three years, in January, we are getting freeze. And this is such a big tree, like 20, 30 feet. I cannot cover it. So I'm losing the blooms. So it makes me very sad. But there are some winters where we don't have that freeze. And I enjoy these blooms for two, three months. It's very hardy. It will definitely come back. And the leaves are also very interesting. This is one of the plants I highly recommend. I call this Southern Bell because um, uh, we used to have peonies back in the East Coast and I tried to grow them, which was a very stupid thing to do because they need that incubation of uh, winter, the cold period for them to induce the blooms. And I cannot grow them here unless I do various things. But camellias, uh, there are some fragrant camellias, but most of them are not. But they are very long-lived plants. Once you find the right space for them, uh, they will live for many, many years. So there are two varieties, Sasanka and Japonica. And Japonica is a little tougher than Sasanka and um, they prefer some shade. So again, these are in the front yard under the oak trees and they have been there for eight years now. And these bloom in winter. They start blooming. The Sasankas bloom earlier. They start in November, January, uh, November, December, and January. And then the Japonica start and they will bloom uh, until uh, late spring. So it's a great plan to have an experiment, create some shade for it, and you will be rewarded. At this year, I my camellias were in full bud. So, and then they predicted the freeze. So I did cover the buds and I did have flowers later. So I wanted to share some of the plants. Again, last few seasons, we had so many, um, uh, so much freeze that everybody is asking, like, are there any plants that like really uh, survive the freeze? And I do have to say that every year I'm seeing, this is my experience, plants are bouncing back much quicker. And all these plants, especially the Texas Superstar plants, are surviving freeze. And I have never, last few years, I have never had to say, oh my God, I my garden is dead. No, because something or the other will come back up quickly. So this is one of the things, and you can see this is Laura Bush Petunia. And I mentioned to you before that it keeps showing up in various places in the garden. And this is my uh, pond uh, motor area, and there it is growing. I didn't even plant it. it it creates that nice color and I can pull it and plant it somewhere else. Trailing purple lantana. So far, it survived every freeze. Of course, Belinda's dream. It's a beautiful uh, survivor. 
Uh, I didn't talk about this Henry and Augusta Dolber Salvia, which is the Texas Superstar plants. And uh, there's most of the plants, uh, um, like several of the Texas Superstar plants were picked from cemeteries because that's where these plants were growing, where nobody was watering, nobody was fertilizing, nobody was caring for them. But still, uh, several roses, several salvias, they and uh, crinums, lilies, so they all do extremely well in uh, cemeteries. And uh, Texas A&M brought these plants into the program, uh, the Texas Superstar Plants program, and they experimented. So Henry Dolberg uh, actually is named after Mr. Henry Dolberg because his tombstone uh, uh, like was had his name and this plant was growing all around it. Then his wife was Augusta Dolberg, which, which tombstone was next to his, and the white one was growing all around it. So they brought these two plants into the program and they named the plants um, yeah, the same name as the tombstones. And they come back every year and they multiply. So you can share, you can move them, you can create interest. And this is a relatively new superstar, Mexican butterfly wine. It is a great evergreen wine if there is one, because most of the times, even the freeze, it doesn't kill it. And I have created that pergola for it. Uh, and it has this nice uh, yellow flowers. And in fall, all these flowers become uh, brown and dry like butterflies, like wings. That's why it's called Mexican butterfly wine. And Hamelia survives freeze. Um, all these plants have been in my garden for the last 10 years, uh, more than 10 years. And every time they came back. So invest in these plants and you will not regret it because you will always have something that shows up. If you want excitement, if you want, if you are into tropical plants, but first have these plants as your foundation, as your backbone, and then add the other plants for your fancy. That's okay. And this is also a very beautiful plant. It's Tangerine Beauty Cross Wine. It's a wine. So you have to um, provide a trellis for it. And it blooms over a period of several weeks. It is just starting to bloom now in my garden. Now it is uh, April, end of April, May. So it blooms all through May. And uh, it creates, it's, it has like beautiful, um, bright orange, reddish orange color. And hummingbirds love it because it is tubular. They go and uh, take all the nectar. And uh, Althea, Althea is a very, very hardy plant. And it's one of the first plants to come up after the freeze. Uh, and uh, uh, there are so many uh, different colors in Althea and they really reward you with this abundant blooms. Uh, it's beautiful. So there are also hardy hibiscus that you can uh, plant. There are several Texas Superstar hibiscus and they can remain in the garden. These Everything in the ground will stay in the ground. So all this will create the tropical look, but they also survive the heat and the freeze. Okay, so now here is the proof is in the pudding, right? So these, I arranged all these plants by month in my garden over the years. And I just want to point out that, okay, before we go here, are there any questions, Rachel? A few questions, yes. Yeah. So, one question has to do with weeds. So, basically, the the weeds have seeded. Any suggestions on how to get rid of weeds, specifically invasive passion vine? without hurting the grass or nearby plants? Yeah, so passion wine uh, in Karnata is the, it's called May Pop. That's the one that pops up everywhere in the garden, but it's also a host plant for Gulf fritillary uh, butterfly. So we do need to be patient because we do love pollinators, um, but it does pop up everywhere. So it's easy to pull out. So you just like run your um, like digging stool 
and it will come off. It will, it is annoying, but that's the only way to get rid of it. You don't have to like apply any anything for it to die. It's very easy to pull out, but it spreads through root. So it will pop up everywhere in your garden. Do you have any knowledge on where a, where you can get a Hong Kong orchid? Yeah, so I got mine from Cornelius. Um, and I think I see it sometimes in uh, Enchanted Gardens uh, and also in Houston Garden Center. The problem with Houston Garden Center is nobody is there to guide you. Uh, so if you need guidance, first go to a nursery like Enchanted or Cornelius. And if you find it cheaper somewhere else, first get your knowledge and then go buy, buy it elsewhere. Uh, so that's how I will do it. What about honeysuckle? Apparent uh, having a so hard time finding there are honeysuckle. several honeysuckles, and the uh, the native honeysuckle Lonicera is also invasive, uh, but it's also uh, a great attractor for hummingbirds um, and butterflies and bees. So there are some that are not invasive, some uh, series. So you need to talk to the nursery. Enchanted health, definitely enchanted health. So if you don't buy the native honeysuckle, the other one might be okay. Okay, so enchanted garden. And they also are honeysuckle. fragrant. Oh, good. So enchanted gardens, you've yeah. seen they have the honeysuckle. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any rose varieties recommended for containers? Yeah, most of the roses grow in containers. Um, actually several people grow them in containers. Roses are not bothered by cold. Uh, they love cold. So you can keep them in ground if you have space. Uh, that way they are more sturdy, but they all will do well in containers as well. Unless it is a really huge shrub. So you need to look at the uh, size of the shrub. Uh, of course, if you keep it in pot, it will restrain the, uh, the growth. And how, what about planting roses or having roses on a budget? Because they can be expensive. Yeah, so uh, there are a lot of people like the rose, the people who are really particular about roses, they buy David Austin, which are the most expensive roses. Uh, but you can also buy, now see Taylor, Texas is the rose. Actually, I'm writing a blog on roses just now. So Taylor is the rose capital and every name company is in Taylor, Texas. So if you have time, go to Taylor and pick your roses or Sam's Club, Costco, Walmart, they all sell the box roses that are from Taylor. So they are, they are all grafted. They are not on own roots. So that's the difference between the cheaper roses and the more expensive roses. But you will not like, you know, it's, it does not make much of a difference for a normal person. If you are into only roses and only roses, then you have to look at this David Austin and the own, own root roses and all that. Otherwise, it's you can get them pretty cheap. Climbing roses can also be grown in containers. Yeah. Correct. Yes. And what would be your, what would be the most fragrant roses or your favorite fragrance? So there is a uh, plum perfect. There is uh, easy on the uh, easy to please. Uh, there is uh, um, these are the roses that I have that are extremely fragrant. Belinda's dream has fragrance, not very strong. There is uh, cathedral bells, which is very fragrant. Um, so there are a lot of fragrant roses. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Think we're good okay so in january uh i have blooms from camellias and for, this is the i don't know whether we call it gerbera or gerbera so these gerbera daisies are not very very much used but they must be because they come back from freeze and they bloom in february and they create this nice color it comes in many colors and they are survivors so we can plant them under the trees in the front yard because they love some shade. And that is a very unusual plant. And um, then daffodils, 
uh, daffodils have like so much fragrance, very heady fragrance, and they multiply every year their bulbs. And these are um, um, uh, these are uh, very well suited for the southern gardens, and they come in various shades of yellows and pinks and whites. And this is this uh, double petal white is called early cheer, and it is so fragrant. Uh, these are also called narcissus. So these are uh, these bloom in uh, February March, and then we have Mexican flame wine in um, March and April, and this is also almost evergreen, and it has this nice uh, Halloween uh, orange color, and it's a wine. So you need to create that. Uh, uh, trellis for it. So April, Belinda's dream. Um, again, these may start flowering earlier than April and they will stay through April, May, June. Uh, so I'm just like, I, I picked one plant for each month. And in May, uh, Laura Bush Petunia and Henry Duelberg Salvia. And you can see the butterfly, monarch butterfly enjoying the salvia. Uh, in June, so John, I put here John Fanick Phlox. This is a Texas Superstar plant. Actually, all these are Texas Superstar plants. Uh, this is not widely available in trade. It, it is one of the few phloxes that, that is very fragrant. So I got this from John Fanick Nursery in San Antonio. That's a namesake nursery. That's the guy who actually bred this phlox. But other phloxes are also great. Uh, then Julia Child Rose, both Earth Kind and uh, Texas Superstar. Uh, and this is, uh, um, this is, let me, Moy Grande, Moy Grande Hibiscus. So Moy Grande Hibiscus also is not very easily available in trade. Um, it is available with the growers. Uh, Tree Search Farm has it. And sometimes you may find it in uh, Joshua's native plants in uh, the heights. Uh, and it is a, it is like 10 inches across. And John, uh, the uh, Moy Grande also is, uh, he is a scientist and he was the one who introduced this plus a lot of other plants. And July is the blue days. And of course, August is the, but my butterfly vine is starting to bloom now. And Hamelia, hummingbird bush, Gumfrina, and September uh, is. Uh, uh, I do. Um, Mexican petunia. So Mexican petunia also is one of those things. Whether you either you hate them or love them, because the flowers are beautiful. It is. It comes in white, purple, and pink, abundant. And but it spreads all over your garden. So if you want to, you know, it spreads through seeds. The seeds will fly. So no matter if you keep it in container or wherever, you need to keep pulling it out if you don't want it at that particular place. Uh, and this is uh, 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 lantana, trailing lantana. So October Duranta and November falls in years, fall mums. So these fall mums don't do anything throughout the year. They just spread and spread and they remain green. But in fall, oh boy, they bloom. They, they explore into these blooms and it's beautiful. And Plumbago and December Hong Kong orchid. And surprisingly, Phalaenopsis orchid is also a Texas superstar plant because it's one of the easiest orchids to grow. So see, now you see, you can have flowers from January to December. Any other questions? Any recommendations for Texas Superstar plants for hanging baskets? Yeah, Laura Bush Petunia, uh, Vincas, um, la Lantanas, Trailing Lantanas, Verbena, um, all this trail, so they are great for hanging baskets. Another question. Um, do you know if there's a website for finding plant exchanges? There are a lot of Facebook groups. 
uh, by region, like uh, Sugarland, Greatwood, there is a plant group, there is KT plant group, there's Houston plant group. So if you look, if you search for plant exchanges or trades, you will find the groups for your region. Oh, perfect. And of course, you can create your own group by in your neighborhood. Like I live in New Territory and we have a New Territory plant swap. So. Okay, I think. I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah, okay. So, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Sima. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Um, suggestions for grasses. Grasses. E Mullies. Or M U L H Y. Yeah, Gulf Muley. Um, there are a lot of grasses that are Texas superstar plants. Uh, one is Carolina Napier grass, Carolina grass, and uh, Gulf Muley is Texas superstar. So most of the grasses bloom in fall. And they can create, when you are creating containers, grasses can be the thriller. So containers have this, you know, the basic principle of thriller, which is in the middle, the tall one, and um, spiller, which spills all around. So you can use the grasses in the center, but the container has to be big. But if you are using Princess Caroline grass, Napier grass, which is very unusual color, which is burgundy, it also is huge. So you need to create that space for that. Gulf Muley also is huge and it spreads, but it has that beautiful uh, plumes. Um, so they all do well. You need to cut them back in early spring. So because they do look kind of sad. Then they'll revive and come back and in uh, fall they bloom. What about any resources for how to support climbing plants, for support for climbing plants, vining? Yeah, yeah. So there are various things that you can do for climbing plants. Uh, of course, the most, uh, uh, depending on how heavy the climber is, how sturdy a trellis you need, you can do the obelisk, which is like a, uh, you know, this tall one. Uh, it is narrow on the top and it uh, widens in the base. So you can do that for small climbers like uh, uh, um, Blackhead Susan or Clematis or things like that. You can also have fan trellises, uh, which actually expand on the top and narrow on the bottom. Um, but you, but for climbers like roses, like I mentioned, uh, Texas Evergreen Wisteria, you need to have really sturdy trellises. So I have pergolas that I use for them. But recently we all started using something called a uh, cattle panel. It's a metal trellis from tractor supply. So it, it has small grids and it is uh, composite metal. So it does not rust and you can, you can cut them. It comes uh, four by eight and you can cut it into small pieces or you can have the whole trellis or you can also actually bend it if you want to have a semicircular and you just install it with T posts and they are very sturdy. So I use them for my vegetables. I use them for uh, flowering vines and all that. So it depends on the uh, heaviness of the plant and the height of the plant. The wooden trellises, I don't recommend much because they start to disintegrate quickly. Any experience on propagating mandevilla? No, I, I never tried it, but it survived the winter, so I didn't have to. It survived? Yeah. Yours survived? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Mine did not. Okay. Uh, back to a question we had earlier on where to get roses. The question was, uh, did you say Tyler, Texas? Yeah, Tyler, Texas ha is the rose uh, center. Uh, most of the rose companies are there. Uh, they, um, uh, David Weeks, David Austin, a lot of, lot of rose companies are there. But there is also Antique Rose Emporium, uh, which is in Brenham. Um, that, that is very popular and they sell very good roses because it's, it's a rose uh, nursery. 
What, what is the rose nursery you said in Thailand? Antique Rose Emporium. Antique Rose Emporium. Yeah. In Brenham. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then are there any advantage, advantages of growing mini roses versus regular roses? So mini roses stay small um, and uh, they, do, uh, they do survive also. Um, people don't use them much because they treat them as uh, florist roses and uh, discard them. But if somebody gives you a mini rose, stick them in the garden. They will do well. Okay. What was, can you repeat the name of the trellis you purchased from Planter Supply? Your tractor supply, it's tractor. called cattle panel. Cattle panel? Yeah. So it comes in, uh, like there, there are big grids or small grids. Uh, generally, for flowering wines, I buy the small grids. For vegetables, I buy the big grids. Okay. And they also sell the tea posts that you can use to set up the panels. Okay. Do you want to open for questions? Have them yeah. unmute, or are you okay? Yeah, so, so these are this is the okay. list of some local nurseries. Uh, Joshua's and Buchanan's are in the Heights. Caldwell is unfortunately closing. They are in Rosenberg. They are closing for retail in May. And uh, Enchanted Gardens and Forest is uh, Richmond and uh, Rosenberg. Uh, so these are uh, nurseries around us, like close to Fort Bend County. Uh, but there are a lot of other nurseries. Callaway's has some Texas superstars also yeah, in Sugarland yeah. on 90. I believe. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, here. It is Cornelius in Dallas. It's Callaway's. Okay. So again, we have a QR code here. If you can please scan that and fill out our survey, we do look at the surveys so that we can better improve our classes. If anybody has any questions for Suma, you can unmute yourself and ask her a question. Hello, I have a question. Yeah, sure. Um, my name is Madhavi, and uh, I'm interested in making a uh, acidic soil for like acidic plants like roses, azaleas. How do you make this? So you have two choices. Uh, uh, most of the places sell rose soil, including Lowe's. Uh, low, uh, I generally buy from, uh, I used to buy from a place called the Ground Up because Ground Up was, uh, had better soils. Um, or you can just use potting soil and use a acidifier fertilizer to that. Or you can use uh, peat moss. Potting soil, acidifier, and peat moss? Yeah. Is there a ratio to mix these? Uh, use mostly potting soil, like uh, maybe 4 one, one kind of thing. So one is to one? Yeah. Four is potting soil, one is acidifier, and one is peat moss. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So Suma, somebody asked oh, me about drift roses. Yes, I was oh. going to um, yes, ask you about drift roses. Yeah, so drift roses are one of my favorites. Uh, there are uh, There is peach, apricot, sweetheart, which is uh, white. There is uh, red, and there is pink. Pink is uh, both uh, double and single petal. So drift roses have become really popular because they stay lower than the regular roses to the ground and they do like expand. Uh, I have the peach, uh, I have the apricot drift roses in my garden and every year they become bushier and they are, they, they, they bloom so well. Can I ask one question please uh, on drift roses? Yeah. Uh, the drift roses, that one of the problems I have is the leaves quickly turning yellow and the stems also turning yellow and part of the plant is dying. What could be the problem? So did you uh, did you give any food to the rose before, like when the season started? Like any food? Yeah, season? the uh, barriers, uh, in the blue box, yes, the fertilizer, rose fertilizer, I did feed them. Okay, 
So but, it but may the, be but like the adjacent that, ones are okay. Only one particular plant is doing this. Okay, so you may want to check the soil around the plant to see if it is any like soil or mulch. Is the mulch compacted? Is there any fungus there? And also remove the bottom leaves uh, if the water is uh, causing any fungus. And if the weather is cooler, you you can try spraying some neem oil, diluted neem oil. Thank you. Yeah. Suma, so mulching for flower beds, do you do wood chips or hay work better, in your opinion? So I use native hardwood mulch because that disintegrates quicker and uh, adds the nutrients to the soil. Uh, hay, sometimes I use for my vegetables, but I have never used for flower beds. Okay. Someone asked, they heard there is a fungus attacking drift roses. Is this true? So fungus happens to any plant and uh, drift roses are, since they are closer to the ground, uh, they are shorter and closer to the ground. And because of our sprinkler systems, the water stays on the leaves and with the humidity that may create the fungus. So generally for my, uh, many of my roses, I have a drip system. I pull the feeder tubes from the sprinkler and then I run it around the plants. So the water is at the root level, not at the leaves level. Okay, and back to the native hardwood mulch, where do you get that? So I buy mulch mostly from France, which is on 359 in uh, Richmond, Richmond or Rosenberg? Franks? Yeah, Franks. Frank okay. Right I didn't have much good experience with living earth, so I used to buy from the ground up. That was my first preference, but now I buy from France. Okay. Any other questions? If you want to unmute yourself, you can ask Suma. So is there any resource for someone to come and take a look and give recommendations about my garden? Um, I do offer garden design services, so you can reach out later. How, um, I have another question. How do you protect the plant from extreme heat? So heat, uh, when you say plants, which plants? Because most of the plants will suffer. Uh, last year we had uh, 100 degrees for two months. So everything mm -hmm. kind of suffered. And you just need to wait it out and then cut them back and uh, restart the watering and uh, fertilizing in maybe September. So in case you want to give, uh, you can also use the shade cloth. I do that for my herbs. So I put a shade cloth on top of the herbs and that will uh, uh, protect them from the extreme heat. I have a 40% shade cloth. Um, can that be used for vegetables as well? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Can you can you... also create a loop um, uh, for vegetables. So, uh -huh. yeah, uh, you can create a structure and just use those, uh, you know, the frost cloth kind of thing we have. That will also mm -hmm. create some shade. I Thank you. That, that will let the uh, light in and as well as create the shade. So will it reduce even the water intake? Um, water intake, you may want to do the mulching. So mulch will retain the water moisture. Okay. And, and also add compost. Uh -huh. You didn't talk about, about azaleas, your thoughts about azaleas. So azaleas are great. And uh, we have two kinds of azaleas. One is Formosa, which is uh, the azalea trail. They bloom profusely in spring and that's it. They are done for the year. We also have the re-blooming azaleas, which, which are supposed to bloom every season, like two, three times a year. And they are smaller. They are not as abundant as, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, as much as the Formosa, but they give you more uh, like repeat blooms. But azaleas are finicky. They need to find the right place they need a little bit of afternoon shade because afternoons get very hot for us. So once you give them that specific uh, space and if they're happy for a year or two, then you will have them for many years. 
Otherwise, they will just die. Thank you. Suma, for your design services, can we con can they contact you via email or how how would someone contact you? Yeah, they can contact me via email. Um, I will put that. I, I have it right here. I'll put that oh, okay. down. Okay, thank you. And can, then, I ask, oh. can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, we have cherry laurels that sit along a wooden fence in our backyard. Yeah. And they actually have not, there's three of them that cannot take the heat in the summer. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they actually seem to be sunburned. We've put a tarp over and that doesn't really seem to help. Is there something else we can plant that can take direct sun during the summer? Yeah, so there are a lot of edges. Uh, uh, so are you looking for privacy along your fence or are you just looking for a green edge? Uh, we're looking for a hedge that you know would, would eventually be as high as the fence. And, and the fence is eight feet? Yes. Okay. So my my highest recommendation would be to go for uh, one of the hollies, either American holly or there is one, something called, I'm going to type it here. It's called Dahoon holly and it is evergreen. Oh, I need to send this to everybody. Okay. Is that is that holly like, uh, I, I think of holly as being very picky and hard leaf? No. So these hollies don't have um, don't have thorns, and they are very bright green. If you if you I don't know if you have gone to Whole Foods in Sugarland. If I've gone where? Whole Foods. Uh, yeah, I I haven't been there lately, but I have been there. So Whole Foods has these hollies, and they are very bright green, and they have very nice red berries, and they are evergreen. They are almost evergreen, and. You can keep them in shape. If you don't want them too tall, you can keep them in shape, but plant them a little further from the fence so they have room to grow. And they will tolerate direct sun. Yeah, yeah, they will tolerate. Well, are, are, are they, is there any uh, worry about dogs? Dogs? Animals? Oh, no. With the berries, okay. No. And it was called what type of a holly, American? American or Dahoon. I, I typed it in the chat. American. Oh, okay. Yeah. And also the oh, other definitely. ones, if it is full sun, uh, and if you want like multipurpose, there is also pineapple guava. That's the definitely evergreen. Even in freeze, it didn't lose leaves. Oh, they'll lose leaves, but they will tolerate intense hot sun. Yeah, uh, mine didn't even lose leaves. And that's a pineapple guava? Yeah, pineapple guava. It all it also has fruits. Does it bear fruit? It it bears fruits. Are they edible yeah. fruit? Yes. They are edible. And will that get to be eight foot tall? Uh yeah, you can grow them tall, yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, excuse me. Um, where can you find a good compost? So compost, again, depends. Uh, people buy either in bags or in bulk. So if you want to buy in bulk, again, uh, I would recommend France. Uh, there is also, what is that? Uh, there is also a company called Farm Dirt. Um, uh, let me type it in. Um, they will deliver in bags. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Of course, you, you can buy... Um, organic compost from Losa also, but I don't buy in bags because I have too much need. So I buy in bulk. Okay. Yes, Yopon Holly is Suma? Oh, Suma, um, hydrangeas, any luck with hydrangeas <laughs> in Texas? Hydrangeas, I tried and <laughs> failed. <laughs> I'm not ashamed to say that. Uh, they Very do, uh, you can try them in shade. Um, but again, they are like, as they, they are worse than azaleas in the sense that they are very finicky here for us. Uh, they, of yeah. course, cold is not a problem, uh, but heat is a problem. Thank you. 
There's another question in the chat, if you, um, by Christy Harvey about drip system. For drift roses, the brown tubing. Yeah. Does it need to have its own valve? Uh, Christy, I believe all drip systems need a pressure control valve. So what I do is like, um, um, there are so many varieties. There are so many do-it-yourself. There are so many sophisticated systems. So it depends on how extensive you want to go. So I ask my sprinkler guy mm -hmm. to pull, uh, to install the six outlet. Um, I don't know what it is exactly called, the drip uh, outlet system. And then I pull my feeders from there. So I can design my feeders depending on where I want to go. So I, I pull the feeders uh, and then I install the um, the sprinklers anywhere I want, the drip drip uh, drippers uh, anywhere I want. They're called uh, soaker hoses, I believe. You can do the soaker hoses. The only problem with soaker hoses is the, once they touch the soil, they tend to start, um, you know, uh, the holes keep uh, closing so the water becomes uh, sporadic so that was my experience with soaker hoses okay unless they are above the soil okay. they, they tend to clog Very quickly about the hydrangeas, I just wanted to say that I do have an oak leaf hydrangea. Yeah. And it does great in the heat. Yeah. And it blooms profusely. So oak leaf hydrangeas, although they don't look like your traditional panicle yeah. hydrangea, yeah. they are, they're beautiful. And they yeah. bloom profusely. I totally profusely. agree with that. Yeah. They are the best ones to grow for us. Of course, the the mop heads, um, we are all familiar with the mop head hydrangeas, which have this big bulb, like, oh. you know, huge ball, balls of uh, flowers, but those are tough. Somebody asked about lavender. Okay. So lavender, again, is a, it needs uh, the trick uh, for growing, in my experience, uh, trick for growing lavender is controlling the water. So if you, if you hold the water the, until the soil is dry, then the lavender seems to survive. As soon as the water, if you if you are planting it in the same bed as other flowering plants, the water becomes too much for lavender here. And and again, you have to create a little bit of acidity. Could you recommend an acidifier? Uh, you generally get a lot of acidifier uh, like fertilizers, uh, but look for uh, an organic one if you are into organic gardening. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, any brand is fine. Okay, thank you. And you can also, for my blueberries, I do the peat moss. So what is the difference between coco coir and peat moss? Like where can coco coir be used? So coco coir is used mostly, in my uh, understanding, uh, as potting mix because it's lighter. It also retains moisture uh, and it also creates some acidity. So uh, that's where you use it. Um, Could you recommend some plants for those? Recommend what, what again? Uh, some plants where it can be used, uh, where you need uh, high moisture. So and a acidity. lot of people also use coco coir as mulch. Okay. What was the name of the bulk compost source? Was that Frank's, you said? Yeah, Frank's. Frank's, Frank's and also if you can get from the ground up, they also have good compost. They are oh, supplying bags. You said someone supplies in bags. You mentioned bags from a particular place. So all these people will supply bags as well. Okay. Uh, I I mentioned farm dirt. They 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 deliver bags.
Thank you. Yeah. If you want compost from a big box store or a local store in a bag, I have, they have it at Lowe's, but I prefer the one from Ace Hardware. Oh, really? Okay. Ace Hardware has an organic one and it's very, if you like the really fine, very um, composted compost. <laughs> yeah. I do prefer Ace Hardware. It may sound weird, but I do the smell test for compost. Yes. Yes. Okay. But yeah, Ace Hardware was a place I didn't think of. And then there it was. And also Enchanted Gardens, but the price point is like yeah. triple to quadruple. To a little expensive, yeah. Yeah, literally triple to quadruple the price of the same at Ace Hardware. Yeah. For some reason. Uh, climbing, <laughs> and I might not say this right, Zephyrin. Zephyrin yeah, so that's, a, that's both is an good here? and a Texas Superstar, and it's a great uh, climbing rose. Okay. Well, thank you so very much, Suma. I always love your presentations. They are my favorite. I love all the information that you have. And now all I want to do is go shopping at the nurseries <laughs> after seeing all you this. You and me, yes. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I'm, I have to go. But yeah. uh, again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. We do have the QR code here again for the survey. We also have additional classes in the Landscape Success Program, and we'll put the link below so that you can register for those. We will also be sending a copy of the recording within the week to everybody who's registered for the class. And we hope that we see you here for our next class next month. So thank you again so much. Thank you, Susan, for monitoring our Zoom. You bet. And we will Thanks end the class. Thanks for all the good questions. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, Rochelle. Thanks, Suma.